everyone's here we're all ready uh so let's get started uh, my name is uh, Grarg. Uh, you may recognize me from a couple of these What's Next sessions that we've handled earlier this week. Um, I am a community admin with Connext, and I am hosting this section for What's Next uh, with uh, DAOs is uh, our topic for this week. We're going to be talking to a handful of amazing protocols in the space, uh, some real fantastic groups. Um, if you're not familiar with What's Next, uh, What's Next is basically a series of Twitter spaces where uh, we get together a bunch of the most innovative projects in Web3. Uh, they have the opportunity to share their vision, uh, what they're building in the space, uh, and kind of just, you know, build some hype, get some enthusiasm generated and some synergies between these groups uh, to try to inspire, you know, new waves of ideas for the next generation of builders. Uh, today we have with us um, some guests from Snapshot, Superfluid, uh, Gnosis Guild, and Optimism, as well as, uh, of course, Connext. Um, so what I'm going to do to get things started is I'm going to kick off by giving everyone here the opportunity to give about two minutes uh, to talk about their project about what they're planning to do in the space um, and uh, what they have coming forward. Uh, so let's kick things off with uh, Nathan from Snapshot. Hey, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me on. It's such a pleasure to be with such other awesome people. So uh, huge honor. Thank you. Um, basically, so for those of you who don't know Snapshot, Snapshot is a governance platform for DAOs. And Basically, it uses an off-chain architecture to make sure that Snapshot is, voting on Snapshot is free and uh, pretty much infinitely flexible. So you can vote with NFTs, with ERC 1155s, with tokens, with a combination. Uh, all of that can be taken into account by, uh, um, by uh, our system as voting power. Um, we've been building Snapshot since August 2020. Uh, I myself joined a, a little bit later, and uh, and it's been just incredible to see uh, the rise of DAOs and all of the awesome stuff that has happened in the meantime. And yeah, really looking forward to hearing from colleagues here what's next. All right, perfect. Sorry, I was retweeting the space. Um, all right, so let's uh, hear a little bit about your project um, from Fran from Superfluid. Hi, I'm uh, Fran from Superfluid. We are a protocol for asset streaming on Ethereum. We basically enable anyone to uh, send money streams. So basically money that is transferred over time from one account to another. We mostly work with DAOs and crypto native companies, helping them manage payroll. And at the moment, we're actually uh, obviously looking for uh, new people to, to come and work with us. We're working with the Connects team to build cross chain streaming. And there's a, a lot of other ecosystem initiatives where we're trying to build basically new financial products that use money streaming. So, all in all, it's a new primitive that enables a lot of interesting new use cases awesome honestly i am super uh happy to have you guys here super fluid is a fantastic service it's one of those things when you hear about it you're just like it does what and then when you actually get to experience it i actually have a couple projects um, that are using super fluid with me and it is really cool i love it um snapshot Amazing before too to i didn't thank you <laughs> no worries um and i meant uh, i for, i didn't even mention before because i was caught a little off guard uh with snapshot is everybody knows snapshot you guys are involved in in governance for so many different projects um you're basically the number one in that space and it, it's really cool to have you guys here um so moving on let's uh hear something from uh Oren with uh gnosis guild hi folks Oren from gnosis guild here we're a uh, i guess society for interdependent software and the keeper of the uh, zodiac open standard uh this is a, a standard for composable DAO tooling um i guess really key uh, kind of core insight there is essentially just 
decoupling account from control. So really encouraging uh, DAOs to, to separate concerns uh, and allow for much more composable DAO tooling, uh, allow them to much more easily migrate from one tool to another or have many different tools all controlling the same account, uh, the same avatar on chain. Um, and we can dive more into that later throughout the session. Really happy to be here. Awesome. All right. Um, and last but not least from our guest group, uh, let's hear from Justine from Optimism. Hey, everyone. I'm Justine um, at the Optimism Foundation. Um, so Optimism is an L2 optimistic roll-up with EVM equivalents. Um, kind of the broader mission of the Optimism Collective, which is what our DAO is working towards, is to prove that impact equals profit, um, primarily via retroactive public goods funding. Um, so public goods can be open source software or any goods that um, doesn't have kind of like an obvious business model. Um, and we will be funding those types of goods retroactively um, with the long-term vision that that will uh, incentivize people to uh, work more on public goods. Great. And last but certainly not least, of course, we have uh, Connect's founder, Arjun, uh, who will introduce himself in our project. Hello. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Um, Connect is a, the most secure way to build cross-chain, cross world cross applications. Um, uh, we are uh, going live with a protocol upgrade in the next couple of weeks um, that, it, that allows for, for this kind of communication. But up until now, we've been We've been enabling like transfers of value between chains um, and rollups. Um, uh, specifically for DAOs, um, you know, we're very, very excited about like the DAO ecosystem. I mean, partly because we are heading towards having our own DAO within, uh, well, as soon as possible. But um, even beyond that, because we think uh, there's this huge, huge need for um, uh, not just tooling for people to coordinate within this, within this ecosystem, but also um, like tooling that sits on top of it that allows people to coordinate across chains. Um, and so from, from our perspective, we see we're very, we've been keeping a very close eye on, on like the DAO space, uh, partly out of interest and then partly because we think that there's uh, not only a huge opportunity for us to be dog fooding um, DAO based products, especially cross chain DAO products as a cross chain ecosystem ourselves, um, but also a, a really, really wonderful space where a lot of new kinds of projects can be built. Amazing. All right. So let's get started. Let's get to the meat and potatoes of this. Let's talk about what's currently going on, because this is what's next. We're looking to the future of these platforms, of how DAOs are going to integrate in the future of Web3. But why do we need DAOs? What exactly should be their purpose? This is an open floor, so anyone can feel free to jump in. Uh, I'll jump in. That's a huge question, I guess. Um, I mean, I think DAOs, DAOs are kind of uniquely good at, uh, at uh, a handful of different things, but I think probably the, the one that's most relevant to a, a bunch of folks here is uh, essentially DAOs are great at uh, owning and operating on-chain assets. Uh, and so I don't just mean tokens uh, and things like that. When I say assets, I mean also protocols and systems deployed on-chain. Um, and I say they're great at that uh, because a lot of those systems, a lot of those assets that, you, uh, that would be controlled uh, benefit uh, greatly from, uh, from distributed control, from from uh, not having single points of failure. One of the, the kind of big value propositions of systems built on a blockchain uh, is that you can uh, have some reasonably strong guarantees around uh, what types of uh, what types of control uh, individuals uh, or what types of influence uh, individuals or kind of small small coalitions of people can have over, uh, over how a system functions, how a system operates. And so DAOs are kind of an extension of that um, that allow those same kind of guarantees to uh, exist kind of further up the stack than just the protocol level. And so it's a 
that's that's one really great reason for them to exist. Um, uh, one thing that they're really good for, and then I think uh, I don't know at a at a less kind of technical level. One of the things that I really love about DAOs uh, compared to more traditional organizational structures is just the super low barrier to entry to uh, instantiating them, to, to spinning up a DAO. Um, it's, it's, it's trivial uh, and, and um, it kind of takes very little time to go from a small group of friends uh, uh, in a chat room to a small group of friends that now own an account collectively and can uh, collectively use it to, again, kind of own on-chain assets uh, or to interact with, uh, with on-chain systems. Um, that super low barrier to entry and then ability to, to kind of transform and evolve into something uh, much larger with much more distributed control is a, 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 I don't know, feels like a very unique feature of DAOs um, it, that that same process in uh, in more traditional organizations is much, much more frictionful and time consuming. Yeah, um, just like building on that, because I, I really love that answer uh, because it touches on both like the, the kind of broader theoretical idea around why DAOs should exist. And then also like the more practical things that, that DAOs like simplify for us. Um, I think just expanding on the first part of that, I like for me personally, one of the reasons why I became really interested in this space is because um, I think their uh, blockchains allow us to to coordinate in completely unprecedented ways, um, and uh, and you know of course those are those are through like economic systems um, like Bitcoin and things like that that basically have like uh, underlying incentives that drive people to behave in a certain way, um, and those are of course a type of organization. But even beyond that, actually being able to directly solve for like the underlying coordination problems um, that happen when people are trying to like interact with each other, coordinate with each other in groups uh, over some sort of shared resource, um, I think is, it's, it's a problem that like we have been thinking about. So basically how do we govern um, uh, common resources is a problem that we've been thinking about for thousands and thousands of years. And this is, this is the first time in human history that we actually have the capacity to experiment really rapidly on those, on models. Um, and I think that all of that is really only possible because of exactly what Aaron was saying, which is, you know, the, the overhead of deploying these organizations and of, of operating them is so much lower than they would be if you were operating them in the real world. Uh, you know, uh, real world meaning in the physical world. <laughs> um, I think the way I usually answer this question is like, to say that DAOs facilitate um, collective decision making, collective uh, ownership, or collective action, and then you can they can those things can be used to uh, achieve like many many different purposes. Um, the purpose of Optimism's DAO is really critical to the mission we have um, of the of the fairness equation, which is impact equals profit. So the way. Um, our DAO is designed as it will be a bicameral system. So there's a token house, which really focuses on driving growth of the optimism ecosystem, which then drives revenue for the sequencer. Um, and then there'll be the citizens house, which is not launched yet, but that will be um, kind of like the, the second house of our DAO, which will allocate that revenue to public goods, which then in turn <laughs> incentivize people to build more public goods, which should drive growth of the ecosystem. And so, um, the DAO is creating like this whole whole flywheel. So that's one specific purpose. But I think at the higher level, um, kind of all DAOs facilitate collective decision making, ownership, and action. Um, well, on my side, I think um, everything's already been said pretty much. Uh, I think those are very, very, very good answers. One thing I would say is like with all a lot of blockchain technology, the way I see it is it's actually a scaling technology. So what a DAO does in my eyes, or at least what, what I would think it should aspire to do, is scaling uh, organizations uh, without compromising on values, right? And that's something that's uh, because of the trustless nature of smart contracts, you're able to do in a way that traditional organizations were never able to do, right? The, the bigger a traditional organization becomes, the more detached it becomes from the base. While I feel with DAOs, there's an opportunity to basically scale that participation and compromise less on uh, 
on uh, individual voices. And I guess that's uh, where I get excited. I don't know what a good example would be, but uh, I feel aspirationally that's where we would be headed. Damn, all excellent points and great explanations of where we are and, and where we're going to a degree. So let's talk about uh, what do you guys see to be kind of some of the DAOs that have seen a lot of traction recently? And why do you think that they're getting those that kind of traction in the spare market? Um, well, we have, a, we have a very good dashboard to kind of look at what DAOs vote a lot right now. And something that makes me very happy uh, is that a lot of very active DAOs right now are infrastructure based. And one that is right here in this school is actually optimism. Right now, if you're looking purely at it in terms of votes, uh, the optimism DAO votes a tremendous amount. And that is making me very happy because if you're very active as a DAO, and voting is just one part of the activity that you'd want in a DAO, right? It's, it's just the one uh, where you can easily see the numbers. Uh, but that kind of activity at the base layer of layer two is certain to bring a lot more activity at the app layer. Uh, and I think this is uh, a tremendously positive uh, thing that we're seeing. Because when you're looking at even something like Ethereum, which has values that I think everybody loves to see and, and, and relates with, uh, it's extremely cool to see governance happen with native tokens. And I really think that as the ecosystem grows, uh, this is going to become more prevalent. And, you know, whether it's grants or it's major technical decisions or technical releases, I'm looking forward to a world where blockchains are actually governed by their users. So that is one area uh, where I think uh, growth is, is really nice. Solid. Good to know. Um, I guess, what kind of use cases do we see for DAOs that are kind of emerging right now in, in the current space um, that may not have been there even a year ago? So I feel like there's um, a lot of the DAO ecosystem is sort of like begun segmenting itself into different categories. So there's, of course, like the the DAOs that most people are familiar with, which is like protocol DAOs, um, which are using like, uh, you know, which are coordinating around like a certain token associated, a governance token associated with the protocol. But then I've also, we've also started seeing like the proliferation of a lot of other kinds of systems like investment DAOs um, that are trying to like maximize the resources that they have under management. Um, uh, you know, guilds, um, uh, and especially like, you know, like guilds that are specific to like a profession or to like a specific, to like a community or a region. Um, some good examples being like developer DAO, um, you know, raid guild, uh, and then things like contribution DAO. Um, and then, uh, and then lastly, I think there's like some of the more niche experiments that people are running around, um, you know, having, uh, like lower, like smaller scale kind of community based DAOs uh, that are just like trying to build an ecosystem from scratch. Um, I'm trying to think of some good examples of this, but I remember One Hive is probably like a really, really fantastic example um, in the Gnosis ecosystem. So, yeah, I mean, I think I think that's one of the interesting ways in which this this landscape is evolving is that like uh, it's it's increasingly becoming the case that. DAOs, uh, like the the, category, the larger category of DAOs represents a lot of different things and that it, that there's a need to like specialize, um, especially if you're building tooling or things like that into these specific niches. Definitely agreed. Uh, I think niches are, are becoming uh, bigger and bigger things. Uh, and the first, you know, uh, I would say things like DeFi protocol for a while and, and they very, you know, sometimes too often act as DAOs. Uh, but I'm very bullish on the smaller DAOs, uh, 10, 15 people. Some of them that, you know, you know, maybe one that I think, you know, one area I'd like to highlight is decentralized science. Um, I mean, it's such an interesting use case, right? Everyone 
is is really looking to how that is going to play out and the fact that you're bringing this very specific niche that doesn't really have much to do with web3 when you first look at it uh but they're actually using DAOs and they're using this infrastructure that we're building uh i think that's insanely valuable and exciting Excellent. So following all that, then, what kind of problems and limitations are you guys are currently experiencing as DAOs? Like, where are the growing pains? Uh, what, what are you guys doing to overcome, I guess, all of those uh, various growing pains? I know that we've seen some talk um, briefly about uh, things like modular architecture. I know uh, Gnosis is involved with some of this. Um, but how, how exactly are you overcoming a lot of these limitations? Yeah, so I think uh, modularity is a is an interesting kind of touch point there. Um, one of the the limitations or that that kind of exists in the space right now is essentially just tooling fragmentation, um, and I don't know that that's necessarily going to change or get uh, get better, but it's a, it's definitely a user experience challenge um, and a, a kind of hurdle for new. Uh, participants in the space to to kind of to to overcome um, essentially getting a grasp on all of the different places that you may need to interact with and keep track of and understand in order to successfully uh, to successfully interact with a with a DAO. Um, I think there's a, a huge kind of onboarding and education responsibility for the folks that uh, are already operating inside of a DAO for any of their new members to help them understand that. Uh, to a certain extent, I think it's some kind of inherent uh, complexity within uh, within DAOs. Um, and particularly uh, as, as the kind of available suite of tooling continues to expand um, and and Ideally, uh, as the, the kind of uh, possible options and combinations of those tools continues to expand. Um, you, you mentioned limitations. I kind of want to take it a, a slightly different direction um, there in terms of limitations on just kind of what DAOs can do. I think uh, a, a lot of the time we focus you know, on, on uh, the things that DAOs are good at, but there's, uh, I think there's a, a kind of I don't know, set of problems that DAOs might be uh, kind of bad at as well. And understanding those is really critical for us to use DAOs effectively. Um, one of those things I think is essentially keeping secrets, right? So there's uh, there's entire industries in, in kind of more traditional business that function largely because of their ability to uh, maintain secrets, uh, to have kind of trade secrets or to have uh, 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 things that are uh, in development, uh, uh, quiet during a development phase. They, they have a kind of stealth mode and then they're able to kind of launch something into the wild that's that's fully formed. Uh, and I think DAOs, because of their uh, kind of open and uh, for the most part, transparent nature, uh, particularly because of the, the, the large number of, uh, of relatively disconnected uh, participants often, uh, they're going to be, or they are, uh, pretty terrible at keeping secrets. And so uh, business models or organizational models that uh, require uh, keeping secrets, uh, I think are going to be really hard for DAOs to execute on properly. Um, that said, the, the converse is true where business models that thrive on uh, on kind of network effects uh, and uh, uh, benefit from having a, a huge number of interconnected uh, people kind of interacting, working towards a, a, a similar goal, or working towards the same kind of outcome, I think benefit very much from, uh, from DAO style organization. But yeah, that, that kind of privacy uh, or secrecy uh, side of things, I think, is, uh, is one thing that DAOs uh, definitely have as a limitation and, and kind of should be aware of when they're trying to figure out how they, uh, how they kind of exist and subsist in the world. I would um, second the comment about fragmentation um, of tooling, but also different processes. So um, I used to 
be involved in Rabbit Hole's Meta Governance Pod, and we were participating in governance for nine for nine, nine different protocols and there yeah it was very fragmented there were so many different tools that we had to use but almost even more so than that it's just the process was different um for each kind of like voting system voting cycle and then how things were done within the DAO, which, which just makes it very difficult for a delegate to contribute to multiple DAOs, and then this just starts to get more complicated as things uh move more and more across chain um i think the other thing that a lot of DAOs are focusing on now or you see a lot of conversations around is sustainability um this tends to come up like about a year into DAO operations and it's just with the speed with which DAOs move it's really easy to optimize for short-term uh decisions and and hard to build (laughs) more slowly for the longer term or to to keep in mind kind of like what is the best best path for the DAO to take um, in the long term, since there is some some sense of path dependence on how DAOs develop. And so I think that's not like a sexy thing, but I think it's something that more and more DAOs are um, kind of reflecting on uh, and thinking about how to, how to build for the longer term. Yeah, I, I think definitely this is a this is quite an issue. It it really comes down to something that Orin said at the beginning. That one of the best part about DAOs is that it's really easy to get in. Well, the problem it's it's also easy to kind of lose track of it. And the beginning of DAOs is super exciting, and everyone wants to participate, vote, uh, chat, and, and everything, and and that's awesome, right? But very quickly the sense of novelty wears off and, and then the challenge becomes how do we keep people interest, uh, interested? How do we give people ownership to make sure that this project goes through and has the results that we want it to have? And some DAOs have been excellent at formalizing that and have continued to ship year after year, but it's a, definitely a huge uh, issue for DAOs. It's actually funny you guys touched on my next point, of course, which would have been talking about the fragmentation of the space as we see more L1s, L2 sidechains, whatever you want to point fingers at, just kind of breaking everything apart for all these DAOs. So what we you were mentioning, though, like, you know, where things are going. So what does this next generation of DAOs look like? We're, we're hopefully breaking through and looking to an emergence in the next little while. So how are DAOs going to be kind of progressing along with it. Oh, wonder if we're having any technical issues here if nobody just has a good response to that but that's perfectly fine um you know it does anyone have any comments maybe looking at how uh DAOs may evolve in in more of a cross-chain space um obviously this is being hosted by connects and as most of the folks here know connects is a interoperability protocol you know working on cross-chain solutions so a lot of our focus is on how things work in cross-chain um, because of the fragmentation we've seen from you know all the l1s and l2 launches and uh, the expansion of the space in a general sense where do DAOs move in, in kind of that cross-chain space yeah we've thought a lot about this with gnosis guild um, it was part of the reason for uh, the the kind of design choices that we made in, in designing zodiac as a standard um, so we, we kind of named it Zodiac because we started thinking about DAOs uh, essentially as this constellation of, of systems um, where you have uh, one, or one or several, I guess, uh, kind of avatar contracts, uh, things like the Gnosis Safe that are then kind of controlled by, by other contracts. Um, but we imagined this... Uh, crossing barriers between 
uh, networks uh, so that a DAO on one network may have avatars uh, on, on a multitude of other networks. You may have a DAO deployed on mainnet that controls uh, an avatar, a Gnosis Safe on Gnosis Chain and Optimism and Arbitrum and uh, Polygon and Avalanche and uh, whichever other networks we can, uh, we can essentially deploy a suitable avatar uh, along with a, uh, a have a, a bridge that we trust to pass messages uh, back and forth. Um, but I think the this kind of multi-chain, multi-layer ecosystem uh, is a reality and is going to become more and more of a reality uh, over the next couple of years. And so uh, DAOs kind of being able to uh, interact with, or kind of enabling DAOs to interact uh, with systems deployed across um, any and all of these uh, additional networks and layers is, is really critical for them uh, to be able to uh, kind of operate efficiently and operate with uh, with the kind of trust assumptions that uh, that we'd like about DAOs um, yeah, in the context of this environment. Um, so I, I mean, to that end, we have been working on a variety of different versions of uh, kind of bridge modules. One is this uh, bridge module with Connext that essentially uh, you deploy a safe on, on some destination network uh, that you want to designate as the, the DAO's avatar on that network. You plug in this uh, Connext module, and now your DAO on your origin network, let's say DAO on mainnet, can now control uh, Gnosis Safe over on uh, Gnosis Chain uh, or over on Polygon or Optimism or, or wherever, wherever it is, wherever you have both the safe and uh, Connext deployed. Um, so yeah, I, I think that this pattern will become more and more prevalent over the, the next couple of months and years. I think that the big thing that's kind of lagging with that right now is uh, just friendly uh, UI tools. Uh, the challenge for interfaces then becomes not only kind of understanding the DAO on one network, but also understanding its relationship with uh, a whole constellation of avatars deployed on many different networks uh, and understanding the routing uh, of, of kind of proposals or, or of, uh, transaction flows from the, the root control mechanism out to each of these other avatars. Yeah, that's a super exciting use case that I think is a lot of people are, are have like talked about for a bit. Um, so we've, we've we've had like a lot of uh, DAOs come and ask us about exactly this kind of thing, where it's like they have some sort of like protocol controlled um, admin function on another chain, on like on a replica of their contracts on another chain, um, and they don't want to have to go through the entire like that's initially controlled by a multi sig, but they don't have to go through the entire process of replicating DAO votes on multiple chains. Um, and so just executing that proposal um, across chains is is itself just such a basic thing, but surprisingly complex. Um, and uh, and I think we're still trying to, as as Aaron mentioned, get a handle of like what that would even look like from from a UI perspective. Um, the it's interesting because there's that's like the the proposal execution side is is one place where. Um, this problem exists, but then you also have you also have the other end of the spectrum where you know you have users that have tokens, um, uh, you know governance tokens on multiple chains, and you need them to be like it's already challenging enough to get users to participate in DAO voting. Um, so being able to get them to vote from any chain, um, uh, and for the protocols that need it, even vote escrow from any chain, uh, is its is its own kind of hurdle. So like how do you bring the fact that this is an organization that is running across multiple chains uh, and that you're trying to participate in, how do you make sure that that is invisible to the, the actual participants? Yeah, um, uh, definitely the, the, the truth is no DAOs wants to have second class citizens that have lower governance rights or something like this. This obviously goes against the, the very idea of DAOs. Uh, what we've tried to do with Snapshot is to add a network field to any strategy that a DAO adds so that you can immediately specify, I would like to count RV tokens on mainnet, RV tokens on Polygon, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, obviously, for everything around execution, though, uh, well, we're, we're very lucky to have uh, built uh, SafeSnap with the help, uh, you know, with the huge help of Zodiac. And things like Connect really 
you know, bring this to the next level. And I think we have uh, a good chance of actually making progress on the, you know, my DAO lives on many chains. Is everyone, you know, how does that work trustlessly? I think uh, we're, it's a super important problem, but we're in, a, in the right direction. Just want to echo something that Oren said, I think is very important, is that what's really missing here at the moment are better UI interfaces, right? If you if you think of mul m most DAOs, right, uh, and here I'm not talking about the big VC-funded uh, startups, but rather the smaller, you know, organizations, they don't simply don't have the organizational capacity to really operate cross-chain and use these tools, uh, you know, and have dedicated engineers managing this stuff. So building interfaces that can actually be used by anyone and that can be set up and understood by anyone is going to be crucial. And I think their um, Gnosis, uh, Snapshots are doing a great job and uh, hopefully leveraging Connects, uh, it will all be tied together in a, in a very seamless way. I'm pretty pretty bullish on uh, on snapshots specifically because I think it's uh, the most uh, probably easily transportable technology, and I've seen people use it in very creative ways. So, very exciting to see technology that can work cross chain natively, and then uh, seeing something like Connect coming and and tying it all together. Yeah, super huge props to Snapshot and the Snapshot. I mean, I think you guys just have such an incredible product. It's awesome. Um, I'd like to uh, just to just to add something in here as well. Like even beyond the the core functioning of the DAO itself, uh, I consider like DAO operations to also include a lot of the other other pieces that sit on top that are part of like day to day operations uh, or day to day like just managing a community. And one of the things that I think I'm just going to show super fluid here for a second. But one of the things that I think uh, a lot of people really sleep on is like the the complexity of having to manage super fluid streams for an ecosystem and then how that complexity just balloons when you have an ecosystem that lives on multiple chains. Um, so like we, we actually, I mean, we're not even connected, not even a DAO yet, but we deal with this problem every day where we have like, you know, users that are our community contributors that are earning, uh, you know, in grants through superfood streams and that's happening on like multiple chains. Um, and so we have to figure out this process of like, how do we, you know, take our, um, you know, organizational multisig, which will, which is a safe and then will eventually also be a DAO. How do we take that thing that exists on a single chain um, and uh, and has like all of our company's funds on a single chain uh, and then in, it allow for you know anyone in our in our organization to be able to like set up superfluid streams to users contributors that are on multiple chains um, and this this only becomes more complex once you're dealing with a DAO right at least with with like our organization, we can at least like take on a bit of trust. But once you have a DAO involved in the picture, uh, if you want to allow for that kind of like accessibility where users can interact with this, with, where like any kind of DAO member can, can set up this kind of a stream or like the DAO itself is setting up this kind of a stream by, by like executing a proposal, how do you even make that happen? Uh, it's a very, very interesting um, problem space. It's actually really interesting that uh, a lot of this chat has talked about the UI or the UX. Um, we had, uh, I, if you tuned in uh, for our liquidity chat and our composability chats earlier this week, UI and UX came up um, in both sessions as well. I, I think there's a very strong realization in the space right now to really get that push towards that end user experience when it comes to crypto in in the general sense and and definitely when we're talking about DAOs and and our individual uh chains or applications here uh there's just the, the, that huge bridge is set to be crossed but who knows um what that will look like or or how i guess successful every button will be and it'll definitely be at variative levels um so what kind of risks do you guys see happening uh when we're looking at DAOs moving into the future. Uh, and, and I know you, a lot of you have tackled this internally, but what kind of mitigations do you have in place for the risks that you've identified? Um, I'll talk about a non-technical <laughs> one first. So I think actually like, there's like a pretty big risk of dis disillusionment. Um, 
DAOs are very experimental and some things are going to work and some things are not going to work. And I get worried that when things don't work, people have the tendency to say, well, DAOs don't work, which is ridiculous because if a startup fails, nobody goes around saying corporations don't work. (laughs) Um, And so I think what's really important is to um, create processes for change within DAOs so that we can keep experimenting. And if something doesn't work, we try something new. But I think... This is the approach we're taking um, at Optimism. And I think the framing around, we're going to do time-bound experiments kind of over the course of four years as we figure this out together uh, is really important to things not being kind of prematurely classified uh, as a failure. Yeah, I'd like to echo that. Uh, Very often people see uh, conflict in a DAO uh, and, you know, conflict throughout governance and they think, look at this, DAOs don't work. But conflict is actually a sign of healthy dialogue and healthy democracy. And every time I see people pointing at conflict, what I see is no opportunity for a CEO to, behind closed doors to slap his fist on the table and say, this is the direction we're going. So uh, I think it's it's very interesting to to keep that in mind when we judge uh, you know, the, the the current state of DAOs. I, I'm obviously incredibly bullish on DAOs, uh, but I do think that we have to accept that having everything in the open like this will lead to some growing pains, but will also allow all of us to share best practices incredibly fast. So I really think that, um, you, you know, the, the time scale of uh, when DAOs are going to have a huge impact is much, much better than what we imagined, much shorter, really. So, yeah. I guess uh, it would be silly not to mention there's a, there's a reasonable amount of legal uncertainty around DAOs. That's, I think, still a, a huge risk to DAOs functioning uh, well over a longer period of time and obviously a uh, implies some risk to uh, to folks participating in them as well. So I think more work towards uh, frameworks that can provide people clarity with their interactions with DAOs uh, is, is, is always valuable. I think on my, on my end, one thing that I'm at least a little concerned about and have been growing increasingly concerned about is just like the, the you know, um, is like the tendency of governance tokens to create like plutocratic systems. Um, and especially when like, as a result of a way a project has been created and launched, uh, a significant portion of those tokens are owned by investors early on. Um, and of course, like, you know, there is, there is a desire from everybody that is like within a project to be cre- credibly neutral and to make sure that their like DAO governance is not being skewed as a result of like unequal token ownership. But, at the same time, I think in the long, over the long run, like, you know, what ends up happening over the long run is that these things are driven by incentives rather than anything else. Um, and so I'm, I'm definitely very interested to see a lot. I mean, I, I think Optimism is doing a really cool job with this, with their like uh, bicameral system, but I, I'm very interested to find like alternative mechanisms for operating DAOs or even, even perhaps like meta protocols that can run on top of like the underlying, you know, token based governance protocols that, uh, that introduce a, additional mechanisms for like distributing power within the organization. Um, so like, you know, some of the stuff that people have been talking about are, um, are like sub DAOs. So having, you know, a better, like having like a greater hierarchy within DAO, DAO organizations. So then that way you have, um, and, and like ideally emergent hierarchy, not, you know, just like running it like it's a company. Um, but as a result of that, then you can kind of like limit the, um, limit how many people, like how many people are involved in a decision in decision making for like very niche problems, um, and by doing that, you can improve like the quality of of discourse overall, and and also improve the quality of like output from the DAO. But yeah, I'm. It's at this stage, I think it's still like quite unclear. Nobody really knows how to solve this this problem of how do you figure out what people want very effectively. Well, it sure sounds like we need to have more and more and more user pools. No, nobody wants that. Um, So 
moving on, we're getting pretty close to the end here. So I'm going to ask one more question and this may sound like a shill question, but we already know at least one answer to this, but what kind of tools do various DAOs need uh, to thrive in the future? What, what tools don't exist or are in their relative infancy right now that you feel need to evolve or need greater adoption to really allow DAOs to thrive in, in a cross chain environment? I mean, in a cross-chain environment specifically, what we were uh, getting at before is just uh, UIs that understand their relationship or interfaces, not just graphical interfaces, but um, yeah, interfaces that uh, that understand the relationship between uh, Adele's various uh, avatars over multiple networks, multiple layers, uh, and is able to um, help people to kind of do whatever uh, sequence of uh, of wrapping of transactions is required to to kind of cross those bridges and, and successfully move messages, move proposals from uh, kind of the governance on on one network to execution on another network. Um, I think not specifically related to kind of the cross chain environment, but just uh, tooling in general to to help DAOs operate. What I'd uh, what I'm really kind of hopeful we'll start to see more of is uh, tools that, uh, well, tools that help to to match uh, decision type to uh, to decision tool, or I should say, like uh, tools that allow us to do better uh, matching of decision type to decision making mechanism. So, um, tooling that's designed specifically for making. Um, uh, some some kind of narrower range of decisions, tools that are designed specifically for allocating budget or for doing payroll or for uh, treasury management or for uh, interacting with, with some specific system. Um, and then uh, as kind of an extension to that, uh, ideally tools where the, the kind of desired outcome is an emergent uh, phenomena, uh, essentially that gets produced by people's uh, uncoordinated and, and kind of self-interested uh, interactions with, with systems. And so that's a, that's a really long-winded way of saying like, uh, we should aim to have decision-making mechanisms that don't require everyone to show up and vote on something, but rather uh, systems where the, the desired outcome, uh, the kind of, you know, well-allocated well budget, for example, that desired outcome is, is not the result of everyone deliberating and, and kind of creating a budget, but rather is an emergent outcome of people interacting with some system that uh, that produces the outcome. Uh, so a good, a good example of that is quadratic funding where people's input to the system is contributing to the projects they like and the output is a well allocated matching pool. Uh, systems like that, uh, or I think there's, there's a really huge uh, design space for that same kind of thinking. Uh, how, how can we uh, apply some kind of algorithmic uh, decision-making mechanism to, uh, to allow uncoordinated inputs to give us the output that we want uh, rather than having people sit around and vote and deliberate on making decisions? Right, I strongly agree with this. Like I think the, the voting aspect of DAOs and decentralized governance is like should be the the really hacky, unscalable thing that everybody's doing for now in order to like make the thing work, but that that should really just be like step one. Um, and what comes next is like the organization figures out meta processes for like what they are trying to optimize for, and then builds uh, mechanisms on chain and off chain mechanisms where which like actually yield the outcome that they want without necessarily having to go through the manual vote each time. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Specialized tools are, are, are incredibly important. Um, I think a lot of good answers have been given. One that uh, has been springing to my mind more and more these days is just this, I think one of the most necessary things is time. Uh, when you look at products like, uh, well, Zodiac is definitely a great example. Like the, the composability of something like Zodiac is so big that... It has not, I mean, maybe Orin disagrees with me, but I, I don't think it has been used at its fullest extent and potential so far. Uh, I know it from from the snapshot side where uh, we've built really cool stuff that hasn't really been widely used yet. And so I think two things are needed, time 
and best practice sharing. Uh, that's why, uh, like, kudos for organizing this because I think this is the kind of things where many people from different DAOs can come and learn about new stuff. And sharing that information is incredibly important. So, yeah, time and sharing best practices are definitely needed as much as new tools and all of that. Yeah, huge, huge plus on information sharing or sharing learnings across DAOs. Um, just from like the delegate or even a, a proposer's perspective, um, I think everybody wants people to participate more. But if you're a delegate and you have to learn seven different systems and understand seven different voting cycles and it's all on different platforms and using different tooling, uh, it, I mean, it's just not even possible for you to contribute to more than than two or three different systems. So I think the more we can share information um, and initiatives like Zodiac or Darstar One or the, the DAO Research Collective are starting to kind of um, facilitate that learning sharing. But I think it's really important, um, not only like the tooling be modular, um, but that the, the processes look somewhat similar. They'll need to be customized, but there needs to be some common thread or or delegates are just going to have such a hard time moving between DAOs. I think that's just a testament to how already we are, right? So if you, and, and also I think to the, to the fact that everybody in the industry is a thinker, a hacker, and a researcher, right? Like, I think a lot of people who build DAOs right now are people who like the idea of designing the DAO and tinkering and finding the best approach and testing different things. And I think longer term, if we want this to scale and we want a lot of more DAOs to form, it will be around, as Nathan was saying, uh, best practices, right? People, um, you know, when people will start joining in mass DAOs, it's not going to be it, not everybody's going to be a DAO researcher, right? A lot of them are just going to come and expect to follow a pattern that has proven to work. And that long term, I think, will also enable DAOs to do more, right? Because um, I think a lot of DAOs spend a lot of time with meta processes, just kind of defining how it should work rather than actually working. Uh, and I think, yeah, it's, it's going to be exciting to see, you know, some of these best practices consolidate, the tools consolidate, and, um, and then kind of see DAOs flourish with just kind of following best practices without uh, everyone trying to reinvent the wheel. So I'm quite, quite excited about that. And also, um, as was being said, uh, sub DAOs, the, the idea of being able to, to delegate and to budget, uh, that's one thing at Superfluid, for example, we're quite excited about because you, you can very easily use streams to create perpetual kind of recurring budgets uh, for different sub DAOs. Uh, that's something we're we're actually going to experiment very soon with a, a rather big organization. So that's something that we you know we want to see more of because I think um, as I was saying at the beginning, I feel DAOs are scaling technology, and the way DAOs can really scale uh, organizations is by creating uh, sub DAOs that have uh, agency to make decisions on their own, right? So reducing the the number of decisions to be made and the number of people involved in every decision is going to be the way forward, I think. And I'm way less bullish on delegates because like what happened at MakerDAO right now kind of shows that delegation can be pretty dangerous as well. So yeah, let's see how, how this uh, evolves. Awesome. All right. Well, we are coming up to the top of the hour here, but we're going to roll a little over as long as everybody here wants to keep up with this. But we are going to start to wrap things up. So uh, we're going to take a couple minutes here. I'll give each of our speakers a chance in turn just to talk a little bit about what you guys have coming up for maybe the remainder of quarter four or coming up into quarter one for your current projects. Drop some alpha if you would like to. Um, and uh, I'll thank you guys in advance. This has been an exceptionally informative talk. Everybody here has been absolutely fantastic. Um, so let's start wrapping things up. Uh, we'll start with uh, Justine from Optimism. Oh, she may have stepped away. So <clears throat> we'll just move over to Fran from Superfluid. Yeah, thank, thanks for the platform. So in the next three months, I think some of the most exciting things uh, at Superfluid are going to happen in our community. Uh, we've got some uh, pretty, pretty cool stuff coming up with some partnerships that we're working on. 
and we'll unfortunately I, I can't actually drop the alpha, but I can say to to kind of follow us on uh, on Twitter and uh, be very very uh, you know keep your eyes open for our announcements. And there's some really cool products that are being uh, built in our community. We very recently had uh, one of our one of our ecosystem projects build uh, the first probably DeFi uh, dollar cost averaging application to be built into mobile, which was very exciting. Uh, obviously, we're working on uh, cross chain um, streaming with Connect. We're working on some new um, DeFi platforms where you're, you'll be able to basically stream in and out of DeFi products. So that's something I'm personally very excited about, streaming my salary into uh, Aave. So yeah, some pretty exciting stuff. And also I, I really wanna show uh, our WavePool. WavePool is a continuous hackathon that we're running at Superfluid where just by building on Superfluid and submitting your project at the end of the month, you stand a chance to win a prize. And this is happening every month. And our budget is actually increasing month by month as we onboard new developers and uh, community members and anything goes it can be an article it can be uh you know a funny meme it can be a product whatever you want to build for our ecosystem is welcome so if there's anyone interested in the um, in the community please come and join us thank you so much and i gotta say streaming my salary into DeFi sounds oh, like a nightmare for my accountant but really cool <laughs> um Let's uh, talk to Nathan from Snapshot. You can wrap things up here. Yeah, yeah I, I feel you with that nightmare from my accountant thing. Um, also, I, I don't think it's good for my finances. I, I'm not great at investing. Uh, don't, don't follow me on Twitter for that. Um, but yeah, in general, uh, I think what we're really excited about right now is a, a whole suite of things. There, there's lots of product that we're building right now that are, I think, going to flesh out a little bit more the governance experience uh, on snapshots. Uh, I think a big part of it is also, we've talked a lot about fragmentation, and that's something we want to tackle. We want to make sure that the experience of participating in DAO governance is less almost professional right now. Uh, you, you know, it's, it's almost a full-time job if you're in three, four DAOs. Um, so, yeah, that, that is very important to us. And the other side that I think really deserves some praise because it's uh, engineering wise, it's really interesting is something called Snapshot X that you can read more about on our mirror. Uh, and Snapshot X is basically uh, full on chain voting, except that all the complicated computation and all of this happens on layer two on Starknet, which is a ZK rollup. Uh, and I think that's going to be really exciting because what we want to reach is not changing the core snapshot experience, still free, still flexible, still composable, but having everything on chain and uh, having execution be a part of it, uh, I think is going to be a, a game changer for uh, DAOs on snapshot. Oh, and thank you very much, Connect, for putting this on. <laughs> no worries. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and you guys, you heard it here first. Follow Nathan on Twitter if you want to learn how to lose money. Um, actually, honestly, I'm going to say follow all of our excellent speakers. If you're not following everybody that's in this uh, spaces on Twitter, you really should be. Uh, we don't know how long Twitter is going to be here, but you guys definitely want to follow these guys and follow Connects if you're not. Um, I saw Justine pop in, so we can roll back. Uh, Justine, we're just wrapping things up and giving everybody a chance just to uh, plug what their projects are going to be uh, doing and for the end of quarter four, coming up in quarter one here. Yeah, for sure. Um, so on the protocol side, um, in, in Bogota, we just announced the OP stack, which is very cool. So I'd recommend looking more into that. On the DAO side, Token House is finishing up voting cycle eight right now. And then we'll have a re like a couple week reflection period where we go over learnings from season two um, and make recommendations and kind of design what season three will look like. So if you're interested in getting involved um, as a delegate, now is kind of the perfect time to do that. And then we've done uh, one round of retro PGF to date, um, but I think you could have a second round on your radar for that, which would be very exciting. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. And again, last but not least, we have Oren from uh, Gnosis. Yeah, uh, 
I guess uh, one of the things that I'm really excited about uh, outside of obviously the, the the kind of bridge modules that we've been working on, in particular this uh, one with Connext, um, which which links up uh, uh, DAOs on one chain to, to uh, avatars on, on any supported. One of the other things I'm really excited about is we have um, a, a module that we've been working on for quite a while uh, called the roles module, which allows you to set up really uh, fine-grained access control to a safe. So uh, again, this this kind of idea of uh, allowing for uh, much more efficient execution of, of uh, specific functions, specific interactions by smaller groups of people or individuals uh, as, as a way of uh, enabling DAOs to be more efficient um, is essentially what this roles module is intended to, to do. Um, and then to that end, we also built a really neat uh, Chrome extension, uh, the Zodiac Pilot extension, which essentially lets you set up these really complex routes uh, between uh, a, a DAO, uh, the, the kind of the DAO safe, uh, a module that might be attached to it, like the, the roles module, and then uh, an account that has uh, has a role. It lets you do um, kind of interact with uh, DAPs, uh, kind of. Uh, web apps for, for, for various protocols um, and uh, simulates the, the whole sequence of transactions every time you hit a button and kind of packages it all, it all up, handles the, the kind of various layers of wrapping to, to route transactions from your account through this sequence of modules and to your, uh, to your DAO. So it, it creates a really uh, compelling user experience for uh, for people who are uh, essentially operating DAOs, uh, people who are, who are the ones responsible for queuing up transactions. So rather than having to do all of this uh, at the kind of ABI level or with, uh, with uh, command line tools or writing scripts, they're able to go and press buttons in applications to, to kind of create these really complex sequences of transactions uh, for their applications. And actually, I think um, uh, on a side note, it ends up creating kind of a better user experience than um, what you would typically get when you interact with Web3 because you are able to bundle together um, sequences of transactions that would normally require separate uh, on-chain transactions. So the classic kind of approve ERC20 uh, and then go and deposit it into something, uh, then go and interact with your, your DeFi protocol. Uh, this application just kind of bundles all of those interactions together. So you you sign once for a, a kind of much more complex interaction. Um, so yeah, those those two things I'm really excited about. Uh, look forward to sharing them uh, more broadly. But if you want to go and uh, explore, they're all up on Gnosis as uh, GitHub, uh, and the the extension is already up in the uh, Chrome Web Store. Perfect. Thank you very much. And I completely lied because Oren is not our last speaker. Our last speaker is certainly, again, not the least, but we're going to hear from Arjun with Connext. Awesome. Thanks. Um, yeah. Um, as I mentioned at the start of this call, uh, or at the start of this space, um, Connext is in the process of rolling out our network upgrade. Um, this upgrade takes us from being a protocol that is you know, used to do transfers of value between chains um, to doing any kind of arbitrary cross chain communication. And so the, the big thing that we're very interested in um, is, is allowing developers to build cross chain applications um, and powering a bunch of really, really interesting use cases like cross chain governance. Um, if you are a developer and you're interested in that, uh, definitely hit us up uh, and join our Discord. Um, and then if you're, if you're a DAO, um, you know, where I'm, I guess the other thing that I'm, I'm really kind of very excited about and very interested in. in uh, getting in front of people as fast as possible is is the work that, Nodi that Zodiac has done. Um, uh, so if you if you are a DAO that is looking to uh, either expand across chains or you are already across chains and dealing with that headache, um, also reach out to us. Um, very would love to talk to you and learn about your experiences. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. Once again, I'm going to thank all of our speakers here today. You guys were fantastic. This was an incredibly informative space. Um, I will remind our listeners, uh, please head over to the Connects Network Twitter if you haven't yet and claim your Galaxy NFT for listening. Uh, if you listen to buy a mobile anyhow, because there are a couple of requirements around that. Um, join us in the near future. We're going to be having a few more of these What's Next sessions. We haven't announced them yet, but you're hearing it here first. 
course. We're going to have a couple around modularity, dApps, infrastructure, tokens. Uh, those dates will be incoming soon, so please pay attention. Follow us on Twitter again for more of that information. Um, also, join us on our Discord if you haven't yet. Get the first up-to-minute dates. Uh, we'll also be having transcriptions of this session or the spaces published uh, there and on Twitter as well. And I'll remind everyone again, please follow all of the speakers here today. This is where the big brains are at. These are the people that you need to know in these spaces and you should be following them. Once again, I am Grog and I thank you so much for sitting down with us today and I hope everyone has a wonderful Friday and an even better weekend. <laughs>